Hey, everybody. In response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, like many of you, I'm trying to learn more about the systems that perpetuate racial injustice in America as part of an effort to dismantle them. Since I have a podcast about food and cooking, I wanted to start learning about the intersection of food and racial justice, which led me to an organization called the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Their website describes them as a coalition of Black-led organizations working towards cultivating and advancing Black leadership, building Black self-determination, Black institution building, and organizing for food sovereignty, land, and justice. Their site was a jumping off point for me to start reading more about black farmers and land loss. And before we get into the rest of this week's episode, I wanted to share some of what I learned. Basically, over the course of the 20th century, the number of black farmers in America and the amount of land they controlled completely collapsed. In 1920, one in every seven farmers was black. By 1982, one in every 67 farmers was black. In 1910, black farmers owned 15 million acres of farmland. By 1982, black farmers owned 3.1 million acres of farmland. By the late 80s, there were fewer than 2,000 African-American farmers under the age of 25. And by the year 2000, there were fewer than 18,000 black farmers representing less than 1% of all farms in America. These are statistics from the documentary Homecoming. Sometimes I am haunted by memories of red dirt and clay and its supplemental materials as cited in a paper by Eileen Shell of Syracuse University. There were a few contributing factors to this collapse, but a huge one is that the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, discriminated against black farmers. To put it mildly, being an independent farmer is really, really hard, and the USDA has many programs, loans to buy equipment at better rates than the bank, financial relief in the event of droughts or other natural disasters to keep these farms going. But black farmers were granted these loans much less frequently than white farmers. And when they were granted loans, the loans were usually smaller and would often come too late. These loans were often supervised, meaning a USDA official would have to sign off on the farmer taking money out of the loan that they had been granted, an extra burden routinely applied to black farmers, but not to white ones. In her paper, Shell notes that black farmers were also denied credit as retaliation for helping civil rights activists, signing up for the NAACP, registering to vote, or so much as just signing a petition. As simply stated on the USDA's Wikipedia page, on a national level, farm subsidies that were afforded to white farmers were not afforded to black farmers. Since they were denied government loans, emergency or disaster assistance, and other aid, many black farmers lost their farms and homes. Throughout the 20th century, this discrimination by the USDA would be recognized, but never really remedied. In the 60s, there was a study by the Johnson administration that found black farmers completely unrepresented on community boards that doled out funds administered by the USDA. In the 80s, the USDA's own civil rights office would find that the agency, and here again I'm quoting from Shell, played a direct role in, quote, the decline of the black farmer, finding that black farmers received only, quote, 1% of all farm ownership loans, only 2.5% of all farm operating loans, and only 1% of all soil and water conservation loans. Uh, She's citing in those statistics uh, more materials from the homecoming documentary. Anyway, back to Shell. Quote, that same year, President Reagan shuttered the USDA's Civil Rights Office, effectively silencing the very branch of the organization that was in charge of investigating issues of racial discrimination. This act further solidified the USDA's problems with racial discrimination. Even as farmers across the U.S. were urged by the federal government to increase their size of operations in order to capitalize on economies of scale, black farmers were largely unable to obtain low-interest federal loans to expand or improve their operations. Basically, farmers at this time were being told, get big or your farm is just going to go away. Unfortunately for black farmers, that meant oftentimes you don't have access to the same means of getting big as your white counterparts, so your farm is just going to go away. In the 90s, the Secretary of Agriculture at the time would testify to Congress that the agency's system for resolving discrimination complaints was broken. Again, from Wikipedia, quote, the USDA Inspector General reported that the discrimination complaint process lacked integrity, direction, and accountability. In response, Congress paused the statute of limitations on USDA discrimination complaints, which then opened the door for a huge class action lawsuit on behalf of black farmers known as Pigford v. Glickman. 
Ultimately, this lawsuit would result in the largest federal civil rights settlement to date. But as Shell points out, in the meantime, many farmers had taken out large commercial loans with high interest rates, and the settlement payouts, mostly in the form of $50,000 cash rewards, were often too little, too late. As she writes, quote, Black land ownership often meant stability, autonomy, and political power in Black communities, end quote. That combined loss of time, land, stability, and power couldn't simply be bought back. I'm grateful to the National Black Food and Justice Alliance for providing a framework for me to start learning about the intersection of racial justice and the food system and sharing some of what I learned on this platform. You can find out more about them and donate to support their work at blackfoodjustice.org. If you know of other organizations doing similar work, I would love to hear about them. I'll provide a link to the Eileen Shell paper, Racialized Rhetorics of Food Politics, Black Farmers, The Case of Shirley Sherrod, and Struggle for Land Equity and Access from which a lot of this was drawn in the description for this episode. I'm in no way an academic, but I found it to be readable and fascinating. I also drew a lot from the Pigford v. Glickman Wikipedia page. The homecoming documentary seems to no longer be available online, but if you know of where to find it, please let me know. Here's the rest of the show. Hello, and welcome to Stay for Dinner, a podcast of cooking, curiosity, and conversation. If you love cooking, if you hate cooking, if you have no idea how you feel about cooking because you've never tried it before or anywhere in between, congratulations, you are in the right place. The place right now is my small apartment kitchen in Los Angeles, and I am DC Pearson. I am an author, a comedian, and an enthusiastic home cook. And today I'm going to be doing something... I would say doing something different on the show, but we've been doing a lot of different things on the show recently, and this is going to be a new different thing. Obviously, when I started the show, the premise was having people over, making food for them, talking about it, and using that as a gateway into conversations about food and cooking and all that stuff, and ever since quarantine in whatever form that has taken here in Los Angeles. I haven't been able to have anybody over and I'm still not going to have anybody over for the foreseeable future. But in the meantime, I thought, well, I still want to talk to different people and have guests. I still want that to be a part of the show. So why don't I reach out to people who I couldn't have on the show anyway, because they don't live here. And one of the first people I thought of is a buddy of mine, a very talented musician, comedian, Andrew Rose Gregory, member of the Gregory Brothers, who you may know from Songify the News and so many other amazing musical videos, an extremely talented family, and Andrew is an extremely talented guy, and I know because I follow him on Instagram, quite the home cook in his own right, so I thought, why don't I reach out and talk to Andrew? So we're going to be hearing from him a little bit today, and in the meantime, I am going to be making some food that Andrew will in no way taste at any point, is just what uh, Haley and I are going to have for dinner tonight. And when it's done, then I will toss to my conversation with Andrew. But in the meantime, before we get into that, today I am going to be making a... uh, kind of a Thai-style Korean barbecue. I saw Chris Yen Bamroon from Night Market, who I also follow on Instagram. I saw him make this on his Instagram story, and it looked tremendous. He was doing it with short ribs, and he was like, this recipe is actually in my cookbook for my restaurant, Night Market. And I was like, oh yeah, we have the Night Market cookbook. I should make that. And so we have it. It's great. I haven't cooked out of it as much as I would like to. I was kind of just breaking into that when all of this stuff started. So haven't had access to a ton of different ingredients, but this felt like the right Venn diagram of something that I could approximate with what I have on hand. And I just thought it seemed really fun and it looked really good when he was making it on his Instagram. So I thought, why not do that? But with a lot of other different stuff, I just want to capture any part of that feeling that I possibly can. Um, But as he was describing it on his Instagram, in the book it's called Thai Style Korean Short Ribs. 
but he says a more accurate name for this recipe might be Korean short ribs as made by Thais who have never been to Korea. Generally, when Thai people think about Korean barbecue, they think about sesame oil, which is because it adds a very specific rich taste you don't find in Thai barbecue. The Korean style marinated that I use is basic, but infinitely applicable and totally delicious in an uncomplicated and direct way. That sounds great to me. I like infinitely applicable because I don't have short ribs and I like totally delicious. Who, who, who doesn't like totally delicious? And we didn't, haven't really been grilling a ton. So breaking the grill out just seemed like something fun to do and seemed fun to uh, share this marinade recipe with you because if it is infinitely applicable as he describes, then you can try it with different stuff. I am going to take the adaptation one step further and use whole chicken pieces in the Lucky Peach 101 Easy Asian Recipes cookbook that I really like. There's a Korean grilled chicken recipe that's more spice forward. And I thought, why not try something different and do this rich sesame forward Thai spin on Korean barbecue, but still do it with whole chicken pieces because I love grilling chicken and I love chicken in general. Um, I'm excited about this. It should come together pretty fast. Let's get into it. Quick check of my ingredients. The recipe calls for a third of a cup of peeled and grated fresh ginger. I got my fresh ginger, a quarter cup of minced garlic. I have my garlic. We're on the last legs of the peeled garlic that has been in our fridge for a really long time. Two thirds of a cup of Japanese or Korean soy sauce. He also emphasized this on his Instagram story that uh, Chinese soy sauce just has a different flavor profile. Uh, we have Japanese soy sauce. I think we have Kikoman. Half a cup of sesame oil. I didn't actually have all the way a half a cup of sesame oil. We tried to get some sesame oil this week. We couldn't get it. And so I have about a quarter cup and then I looked online and apparently you can make your own sesame oil. It's not supposed to be as good as just, you know, sesame oil in the bottle, which makes sense. But I made an extra like a quarter cup by taking some toasted sesame seeds and then cooking them over medium heat and some canola oil for a couple of minutes and then taking it off the heat, steeping it for a couple hours. And I don't think it's going to be as good as normal sesame oil, but we're going to make it work. This recipe calls for a pound and a half of beef short ribs cut into half an inch slices across the bone. Feels very Korean barbecue having those thin slices of meat. Like I said, I am going to be doing whole chicken pieces and we'll just see how it comes out. Maybe it'll be a disaster. I'm not entirely sure, but I suspect that it will be pretty good still. We won't get that really thin, you know, quick cook like you get in a lot of Korean barbecue, but I still think the chicken of it all and the richness of the sesame and the different aromatics still going to be good. Well, let's hope. Uh, and then later on, we're going to be cutting four green onions lengthwise into thin strands and then two tablespoons of toasted sesame seeds to top. And then we're going to be serving it with some jasmine rice that I will just be cooking according to package directions. So first up, I am going to start getting my aromatics together and I'm going to start that by peeling some ginger and I'm going to start that by taking a spoon and peeling it. One of the reasons I'm excited about this recipe is we have a lot of ginger and I think I'm going to need to use a lot of it to get a third of a cup grated ginger. We have like a big clamshell of it in the fridge and it's going to use a lot of it, which is great. I was originally using a microplane to grate this ginger, but I think I'm going to switch to box grater because the microplane is taking a really long time. Oh yeah, the box grater did the trick. Got me to a third of a cup of grated ginger quite fast. Next, I'm going to mince this garlic. Have probably, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I like 12 cloves. Happy to be getting to the end of this peeled garlic. Definitely prefer working from unpeeled cloves. Some of these are starting to almost like, I don't know, get a little weird and transparent. And I am setting those aside. Don't trust them. But I'll admit, definitely saves a step not having to peel them. 
will help in our ever ongoing project to be eating dinner before like nine. All right, I've got the ginger in the bowl. I've got the garlic in a bowl. And now I'm going to add my soy sauce, two thirds of a cup. Guess I could take this little spout top off, but the noise is kind of charming. And then my sesame oil, half a cup of sesame oil, which in my case is a combination of about half and half actual no fooling sesame oil and then off-brand Fugazi, Fugazi uh, homemade sesame oil, quote unquote. Mm, I definitely know what he means. That r richness of the sesame oil is very, very appealing. Even mine being cut with faux sesame oil. Now we're adding one tablespoon of white pepper. Sometimes I ish, sometimes I measure. Today, for whatever reason, I feel like measuring. I think maybe just sometimes I feel like when you make marinade or when I make marinade, I shouldn't generalize. You, perhaps you do it perfectly, but I will often, if I ish it, sometimes maybe I go on the conservative side and then I don't feel like there's enough marinade liquid wise to cover everything that I'm making. So today we are measuring. Three tablespoons of sugar. Whoops, oh boy, I spilled a ton. Hilarious. Have to scoop some of the sugar off the cutting board with my fingers because I spilled it all over the place. Now I've got all that stuff in a bowl and I am going to stir until the sugar dissolves. Okay, I have all of my chicken pieces in a baggie. I'm going to take the breasts out, set them aside and add the marinade in. And if it seems like there's a lot of marinade to go around, I might add them back in just because we won't eat them tonight, but it would be great to have them cooked and then they can just be made into whatever for leftovers. All right, gonna pour the marinade into the bag with the chicken. Yeah, there's a good amount of it, which is great. All right, ultimately it's feeling like this is a decent amount of marinade for everything I have. I would even verge on saying it's uh, on the generous side, but I feel like if I add the breasts in, it's gonna dilute everything too much. So I'm going to err on the side of having a little too much marinade as opposed to not enough. Looking good, I am going to put the meat in the fridge for a couple of hours. Apparently, if you are using short ribs, you're just going for about an hour. And then either way, you're gonna take them out about half an hour before you're gonna cook them to let them uh, come up to, you know, lose a little bit of the coldness. I hesitate anytime I'm dealing with chicken to say like literally come to room temperature because obviously that can get dicey, but not be quite so cold all the way through. Basically, the long and short of it is that it calls for an hour of marinating in the fridge if you have the thin sliced short ribs. And he basically says if you are doing different cuts of meat and experimenting, you're gonna to wanna to add an hour or two to the marinade time. So I'm gonna marinate for at least two hours and then take them out of the fridge for about half an hour. And I will talk to you in two hours, at least. All right, still have about 45 minutes to go in my marinating period before I take the chicken out and light the grill. Before I forget and get busy making rice and other junk, I am going to cut four green onions lengthwise into thin strips. These are gonna be scattered on at the end, so not my typical way of cutting green onions into little rings or even sideways for garnish. We're gonna be cutting them basically into like straws and I will probably be cutting off the white ends and adding them to my rapidly growing jar of rapidly regrowing <laughs> scallions. It's getting to be a fun little forest in here. And I'm gonna make like, before I cut them lengthwise, I'm actually gonna cut them in like two or three places widthwise so that I'm gonna end up with these straws that are about Eh, like two inches, three inches long. All right, it's been a little more than two hours. I am going to pull my chicken out of the fridge and light the grill. All right, 
<laughs> just switched inputs. I think I'm recording now. Uh, so I am out back, just got the grill out, going to, going to uh, light one side. I'm working with a gas grill, but you can create the same effect with the charcoal grill. One side hot, the other side not, and uh, going to start my chicken on the indirect side, probably for about 10 minutes on each side, and then flip it, and uh, then move it over to crisp up the skin on the direct heat side. And if I sound muffled at all, it is because I am wearing a mask, because you get it, you know why. But gonna let that go and get up to 325. I may turn on both sides just to get it up to heat a little bit faster. I don't know if that's best practices or not, but it's what I'm going to do. All right, going to get these on the grill. I don't think I need to um, oil the grill grates because there's oil in the marinade, but I am just because it's what I'm used to doing, so better safe than sorry. Hey, I already got a little bit of a flare up. My grill could be cleaner, to be quite honest with you. Move that thigh. I'm putting these on the indirect side, seeing how much of the marinade is left over just in the uh, bag. Kind of makes me want to like paint more of it on or something. So I'm doing that right now with my grill brush. It might be stupid. There might be plenty of it already in there, but who knows? So I've got it skin side up right now and then I'm going to flip it in about 10 minutes and again it's on the indirect side and when I close the grill I'm gonna get it back to about 325. So I have had the chicken on the indirect side at about 325 for a decent amount here probably like 10-12 minutes a side ish. The thighs are the things I'm most worried about. I feel like those take the longest to cook and so I'm going to uh, get the direct side as hot as I can and then move these over. Probably be a decent amount of flare-ups because I have oil in the marinade, but I'll just keep an eye on things. But one of my least favorite sensations in cooking is pulling the chicken thighs out of the oven or off the stove or off the grill or whatever and having them be underdone. So I might leave those on for an extra beat or two just to be safe because as longtime listeners to the show will know, our meat thermometer is broken and I haven't had it together to order a new one. I am gonna oil up the direct side. And one thing I'm taking away from the recipe is that some char is a good thing. So normally I would be super worried about flare-ups. I'm still kind of watching it, but I'm mostly keeping the top down and just letting the hot side do its work. Alright, I've been shifting the pieces around based on their size and their seeming doneness and just kind of flipping them around in a way that didn't feel super productive to narrate, but they took on a pretty beautiful color and got some decent amount of charring in spots and I think everything's done. Again, uh, it's a meat thermometer world I'm living in right now, so I'm not super sure. I'm gonna have to cut them open and see, but uh, I think we should be okay. We will find out. And once I do that, if they're not done, I'll, I'll obviously throw them back on, but then I'm gonna scatter them in the uh, scallion threads that we made earlier and sprinkle some sesame seeds on top, serve it with some jasmine rice. I just made some kimchi this week, so I might do that on the side. It's not my best batch in history, but it should be okay. And we should be good to go. Well, Andrew Rose Gregory, thank you for being on my first fully remote episode. I would normally, if you were here in person, be placing a plate of food in front of you and, and telling you about it. I apologize that I cannot do that. So all I can do is just hope that whatever you ate last was, uh, ner uh, you know, full of, of nutrients and also satisfying. It was, it was pretty great. You know, I'm three hours ahead of you here in New York City, so you're probably, like, still in a real 
breakfast zone, like I've crossed over into the lunch zone and even had lunch. So <gasps> yeah. I had a broccoli rob and sausage and sausage sandwich on Kasha. It was really good. Yum. It was great. Yeah. That sounds that's fantastic. Been, that's been like a little bit of my I've been trying to get into a little bit of a habit. I've never really been a home baker. Um I, I suppose this is uh what a lot of people are are getting into or trying out for the first time. But I, I've been trying to bake a big sheet pan of focaccia every week. And I I've I've done that for about six or seven weeks. So oh my the, gosh. It really really elevates the sausage broccoli rob sandwiches let me tell you (laughs) i i can only imagine have you enjoyed being in a rhythm like that and kind of making your uh your weekly bread so to speak i have yeah and i think you know i i had like seen all of the so many people are like going deep into the sourdough zone and i was i was i was starting to go in that direction and then when I like started thinking of like the real like crusty manly loafs that everyone is is posting on Instagram, you know, as they're perfecting their score of the top of their <laughs> their sourdough loaf and all this stuff, I was just sort of like, I want to do that and be cool, but I also feel like it would scratch the top of my mouth. Mm. Uh, you know, they're just also crusty, and it's like mostly like I'm not making like you know saucy french meals really here that i would use like a fine sourdough to sop up i just want to eat sandwiches mostly for lunch so i was like you know what i'm gonna mix it up i'm gonna i'm gonna go with a sourdough focaccia and that's what i've been doing focaccia does not have the curb appeal for me that it should even though i understand that it's delicious i think i fell prey a little bit to in the 90s when focaccia was sort of Obviously not. I I was about to say like when focaccia was first out and it's like, no, focaccia has clearly been around in Italy for forever. But when it was sort of kind of in the way paved by like pesto or sun-dried tomatoes, the sort of like hot Italian ingredient or thing that companies and and places in America were adopting and being like, throw it on focaccia. It sounds trendy. And I think I might have had a lot of bad or not so great focaccia, corporate focaccia at that time, that (laughs) (laughs) that also I feel like maybe there was a lot of just like really dry rosemary on top of it that maybe now I would enjoy, but at the time I was just like, what are these sticks? Yeah, totally. But I think for, for me, I always thought of like, I think for a very long time I thought of focaccia as being something that you eat on the side of your pasta to like get up the sauce maybe. And then like, then you kind of get into like, have you seen the movie big night uh, DC? I have not. I almost watched it a few years ago. It's a great story. I think we started watching it and then got distracted or something, but I would love to revisit it because I I I heard it's great. I wouldn't, I feel like, I, I feel like it's legend now has kind of surpassed its, I feel like it, it went through like a long period of being underrated. And now I feel like so many people talk about how underrated it is that now it might have passed into a period of being overrated. Mm. Uh, but the specific problem my wife and I had watching it is that our, my mother-in-law described this one scene in the movie. My mother-in-law has incredible taste in movies and is always turning me on to like these awesome, like great movies from the seventies and eighties and nineties that I like, I really missed out on. And, uh, like After Hours, the Martin Scorsese movie. I sure. never heard of it. She told me about it. Unbelievable movie. Uh, so she told us about this one scene in Big Night. And I was like, that scene sounds amazing. We've got to watch this movie. <laughs> and then when we turned it on, it's like literally the first scene. And uh, it is the most famous scene from the movie. And like the rest of the movie just isn't as good. <laughs> like that's the best scene. <laughs> but the scene is a guy that the movie is a, the tension between like the chef who like their brothers, the chef like really wants people to eat Italian food right. And it's like the seventies where people don't get Italian food. And, and the front of the house guy is just like, Oh, we got to make money. We're going broke. And these, I guess this couple comes in and orders like, Oh, we're going to have the spaghetti and then we're going to have the penne. And the, the chef who I believe is portrayed by Tony Shalhoub, like storms out and just gives them a dressing down about like, they're both preemies. You can't eat a preemie and then follow a preemie with another preemie. You have to have the secondy. <laughs> and just like tells them they're eating a pile of bread, like all this stuff. 
So similarly, I feel like there's a moment where I like was like, why am I eating this focaccia? Like I'm just I'm eating like a baked bread right next to my boiled bread, you know? Uh, I but I, I do. But I think now I've realized like just in the last couple of months I've been like why like why why isn't focaccia in the discussion of top sandwich breads? Because I really think it should be. And I think especially when you're talking about like having a soft a nice like soft sandwich bread that can hold its own but and hold yeah. some some toppings and stuff like that but not be the straight up super crusty sourdough which I agree is wonderful but is not a a one size fits all bread solution yeah, necessarily all the, the time. The focaccia is nice and soft in the middle but it's a little, you know, a little not crunchy but kind of chewy on the outside, golden brown, you know. Ooh, you know, I will you say d- you have to you have to be careful slicing it, you know, cuz it's like that focaccia is maybe only like an inch and a half, 2 inches thick, you know. I have right. had some embarrassing slices where I feel like I'm starting in the middle and going like straight down. And then I just like come out in like the top of the bread, like two thirds of the way through the slice. And I'm just like, oh, that's, that's, I, I really screwed that up. <laughs> you have a moment like that. And then you go like, oh, there's a reason the best thing since sliced bread was invented is a, is a, yeah. is a, is a phrase. Because we've been having similar experiences. Uh, Haley, my wife, has been a part of 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 sourdough nation she got a apparently like 100 year old sourdough starter from a woman in san diego on ebay who this woman i guess took it from a restaurant that she worked at in the 60s she took a little bit of the starter home and at that time it was a you know already a 40 or something year old 50 year old starter and did she have to sneak that out the back was that an, was it, are you allowed to walk i'm out not sure i'm not sure if it was just like she was leaving to pursue her dreams and I, I you like how much like emotional content i'm reading into this and they were like you know what kid you're gonna need no matter where you go you're gonna need a little sourdough starter and they were very ahead of their time on that and like gave it to her in a, in a little jar or something but i think basically the idea is that you can have it in various states of non-activity where it will survive for a really long time so like so when she sent Haley some it was it was dry completely it was like a powder yeah. that Haley then had to like wake up and, and bring back to life so I wonder if she wasn't given it in some form or she also could have there could have been a fight or something and she was leaving and as a final you know thumb in the eye to the restaurant she you know pinched off a little bit and and stuck it in her pocket and picked the lint out when she got home or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. If drying is the best way to, you know, preserve a sourdough starter, which I've heard it is, you know, just mix a sourdough starter that morning, you know, just casually wipe your hands on your pants, you know? There you they, go. They, you're leaving at the end of the day. They're frisking you to see if you're trying to walk out with any of the sourdough <laughs> starter. Then you go home, just kind of rub your pants, get that dried sourdough starter off. You know, it's, it's easiest easiest crime you ever committed. It's kind of Shawshank Redemption-y. Just in terms of yeah. transporting dust via pants secretly. Yes. Sneaking out just, you know, a couple, <laughs> a little bit of it every day. I, so we, uh, I, no, I briefly, I, I used to work in a bakery and I will say about bread slicing. I think if you've ever used like the best things in sliced bread, you're just like, oh, whatever. What does that even mean? Then you get to use an industrial quality bread slicer. And it is a thrill, DC. If you ever, <laughs> if you ever get a chance, you just pitch a loaf of bread in, and just the whole thing just starts shuddering. And you, there are a couple controls to get how thick the slices are, and then you're, you know, this is like when you're working in a bakery. It's just like you can take home as much bread as you want, you know. So it's like, oh, it's a Friday. I'm going to take home a loaf or two of bread. You get to pitch them in, set the set the dials, and then like bam out comes this like perfectly sliced bread like i think i think that's what people were really excited about it wasn't so much the sliced bread was just the thrill of throwing their bread into this you know contraption that also could have sliced off their fingers the expression shouldn't be the best thing since sliced bread it should be the best thing since a bread slicer an industrial bread slicer yeah. industrial bread slicer which doesn't quite roll off the tongue in the same way but but these yeah, I are wonder... <laughs> sorry please oh i just i was in um Casey and I took a cooking class. Casey had to go to Italy for work last year, and I I went with her. And we, Sucks. We, we we stretched out the trip a little bit and stayed for a long <laughs> weekend. And we took a cooking class at this woman's oh, home, and she basically fantastic. was like, "Oh, it was, it was so fun!" But she had in her kitchen like an industrial meat slicer, just like in her kitchen, which really amazed us, you know. And she has like, sure. And she was like, "Oh, any?" She was like, "This is in. This isn't because I am teaching a cooking class. Like, this is every kitchen." 
in this area and it's like around Parma and it's because everyone is eating prosciutto and Parma ham all the time. And she was like, no, no person in Parma would ever go into a shop and be like, one pound of prosciutto, please. She's like, no, no, like that's too expensive. Like you just go in and you buy a leg and you just eat off that leg for the next three months because and you're and you slice it off now i will say we noticed several people in the area that were missing fingers so you have to wonder if there's a connection there (laughs) but i want like if sourdough but think of all the 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 money that you lose in productivity in not having a finger you more than make up for in buying pounds of prosciutto (laughs) prosciutto by the pound you can't really i don't know you can't really throw a huge sheet pan of focaccia in a in a bread slicer, I don't think. Do you like the? Is there something about it being in a sheet pan that is is part of the appeal to you? That because that does sound uh, appealing. It is pretty satisfying <laughs> to spread it out and like the whole the whole like half sheet pan, you know, like the big like sure. the aluminum Nordic wear ones, and Ugh. so you spread it out and I you have to cover it overnight and like I realized oh like how many like oh I have two sheet pans so I get to flip the second sheet pan on top of the first sheet pan and. Like now, like I've done it six or seven weeks running now. It's it's really become like a little bit of a like, like you, the nice thing about it is I feel like the first time you do it with any recipe like that, that just involves a lot of waiting, you start to do it. And then you realize like, oh, I, I, I did something dumb. Like I did this step at 8 PM thinking that I have a lot of time before I go to bed. But like the next step is like wait eight hours. Mm. so then you're like well like am i gonna wait four hours and try to do this at midnight or am i gonna (laughs) wait 14 hours and do this at 10 a.m and the nice thing about doing it for six or seven weeks is i feel like i start to be a little less dumb about the about the waiting you know of knowing like okay i do those steps at 9 and 10 and 11 and then the next step i'm going to be doing at 11 a.m you know or or, you're starting to feel the rhythm of it a little bit more yeah that i yeah and and starting to like learn a little bit more about sour sourdough like which i'd I'd never done before you know i'm embarrassed to even be talking about it but but oh like like oh right i don't need to feed this every day like if i'm baking the the bread on friday i can just have it in the fridge from saturday to thursday you know why do you say you're embarrassed to talk about it just because a lot of people are making it right now or i think well i think yeah, I I sometimes describe this effect as, um, and I think we could we could argue about the name of the effect, to, uh, and I would love to argue about it with you. I, <laughs> since since like the middle of the '90s, have referred to this as the Dave Matthews Band effect, which is when you like something that is worthy of liking, but then so many people around you start liking it. Perhaps after you started liking it, like perhaps you had an advanced copy of the album under the table and dreaming before all your friends did because Just you lived only two for... and a half hours from where the Dave Matthews band started in Charlottesville, Virginia, <laughs> and they would do local shows in Blacksburg. Uh, so the Dave Matthews band effect is you think the Dave Matthews band is really cool in 1994. And then by 1995, 1996, the culture around you is so saturated with like love of the Dave Matthews band perhaps including by a lot of people that you don't really like that you can no longer in good faith like the good the Dave Matthews band the way you once did and I feel like there's a little bit of a Dave Matthews band effect here going on where it's just sort of like of course this is a very enjoyable experience for me but I'm just like a little embarrassed at just like the the trendiness of it all and like and like you're already like for like eight years the 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 laziest shorthand in any like work of fiction or any advertising like <laughs> like 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 uh, any tv show or movie like if you want to show that a hipster is annoying you just give them a man bun you know like right and that's just like the easiest it's like if you want a dad to be mean you have him talking on the cell phone and that's like that's been canon since the movie hook you know now since like 2011 2012 it's like you want to make a hipster really annoying you give him a man bun and I'm starting to already see like that trickle into like advertisements that have been made like hastily in the last two months. Like, oh, are you working on your sourdough starter? I see. And it's just like, Ugh. Ugh. Does that make sense? It it absolutely does. And I I know what you mean. And I have had that 
many times in my life where you get into something and then you start to see that a lot of people are into it. And for whatever reason, it makes you feel like I can't be into that anymore. Or like you said, I can't be into that in the same way. And I don't know. I think in this case, I think you got to go like, this is something that's been around since the beginning of time almost. I mean, not literally, obviously it was a, a, a big deal and a big invention when, when they actually figured out like yeasted bread or whatever the proper term for it is. But like, it's been around since the beginning of time. So whether it's just a thing that you're doing right now, because it is to completely understate the case, a a weird time these in in these un, uncertain times in, these in, in the language of those times. of those same commercials maybe it's just something that you're doing for right now and you'll look back on it a few years and be like oh remember I w- when i was making that focaccia and you haven't thought about it in a in a really long time or it'll be something that you keep doing for a really long time and then your grandkids will look back and go oh that you know we still we're so lucky we still have uncle andrews you know focaccia recipe his, his, that he you know it it who knows i i know what you mean i understand what you mean but i think like it's working for you right now i think there are probably other people listening for whom that that have something similar and then there are probably some other people that are like oh my god more sourdough talk but that's just sort of where we're at right now and i i i'm i'm sympathetic to it especially as somebody who who has been working on a home cooking podcast for like a year and and trying to get it going and recording episodes in, in various forms and then finally was ready to launch it and was already planning to launch it when this these times became these unprecedented times. <laughs> and then suddenly everyone is talking about home cooking. And on the one hand, I was going, oh, that's really exciting. Everybody's talking about this thing that I've been really into that I'm making this this podcast about. And again, I also in no way invented home cooking. This is like uh, incredibly important, you know, cultural and like nutritive force and such a big part of so many cultural traditions in the world and family structures and all these different things. So, but I will admit to having a little bit of a snooty sort of like, wait, on the one hand going like, oh, great. Everybody's wondering about home cooking now. Maybe that will mean more people will listen to this thing that I've put a lot of work into. And then on the other hand, I got a little what you're describing where I was going like, oh, well, if everybody's kind of into it right now, maybe that'll mean that soon a lot of people won't be into it or they'll be sick of it or bored of it or the, or will just be oversaturated with it. And really all I could do was go like, well, it's working for me right now. I'm enjoying putting it out. So I'm going to keep doing it. And if there are people who are like, ugh, so much cooking content, they don't have to listen to this. And if there are other people who, for whom this is an enjoyable listening experience, whether or not they're cooking or however it's fitting into them cooking, that's okay too. All I guess all I'm trying to say is both of these things are like practices that are working for us right now. This is my uh, this is my pan of focaccia. Yeah, and as much as like as much as I understand the psychology of like of of 13 year old Andrew like being annoyed <laughs> by the sudden popularity of Dave Matthews Band and like coming right. to hate them, like like on the other hand, it's just like well like. Why shouldn't those other people enjoy the song Crash? And like also like why shouldn't Andrew just con- like little 13-year-old Andrew just continue to enjoy it cuz he liked it the first time he heard it. And you know it's the, it's the same thing with the same thing with this. It's like, well, like I if it's a nice rhythm to have to my week, like why not, like it, you don't throw your sourdough starter in the trash because your annoying next-door neighbor is like, "You you do sourdough too?" Was there a particular recipe that you like locked into at at the outset i have i have locked into a recipe I, I was thinking about trying another one but i forgot uh i've locked into a recipe um that's a king arthur flour sourdough recipe and i i think it's in a way it's like a little bit of a cheater sourdough recipe because it still involves yeast so i feel like a little bit of a poser although obviously not enough of a poser to lie about it to you um, but yeah, it's a, re- it's a really simple <laughs> recipe. It's really easy. I had a little bit of a sad moment this week, which is, um, I was at one point in my life here in Brooklyn, I've lived in Brooklyn for almost 15 years now. And 
for maybe five or six of that, I, I was a member of the Park Slope Food Co-op, and which is like kind of a, I'm not sure if, you, if you've heard of it or if your listeners have heard of it, I'll kind of try to do a short version of it. It's like this very old uh, grocery store co-op here in Brooklyn. It's been around, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 years. And I, my understanding is it's the largest food co-op in America, not by square footage, but by membership. It just has thousands oh, wow. and thousands of members. And it's just way more serious than you could ever guess. Like, if you're not a member sure. of the food co-op, like, I'm not kidding when I say that you can't walk into the food co-op if you're not a member. Like, you have a membership card, and when you walk in, someone is like, membership card, please. And if you don't have your member, like, if you're not a member, they're like, I'm sorry, you can't come in. This is for members and, only. And basically, I guess we should, we should say that co-ops the idea is that it is an it is cooperative hence the name and it's owned by the members basically but sorry you were saying so the park slope one is just just, it's very like and the idea like i've had friends that were members of co-ops elsewhere in other cities and um generally like it's not a members only thing maybe if you're a member you get like a 10 percent discount while the non-members are paying full price but because the Park Slope Food Co-op is so dedicated to being members only, like they buy all their food at wholesale price. And then when you go in and shop, you buy all the food at wholesale price. Like there's wow. there's no markup. So all the groceries you're buying are like, I'd say you're buying them for between like 50 and 70% of the price you would think that this grocery would cost in a normal store. It's pretty amazing. No kidding. You have to do about, you have to do like two and a half hours of work a month to to stay a member so you have to go in and stock shelves or i had a job for a while where i like answered the phones and took messages i mean there's all all sorts of jobs um like one once or twice i got makeup shifts done by like playing a concert at an event that they were throwing um <laughs> that's but awesome. when i left when i left the food co-op with three or four years ago i was pretty sad because i landed on this really really cush gig the one answering the phones where it was like basically no work i just sat there and hung out with this cool woman who worked the shift with me that we became buddies so it was like super super easy but i just lived a little too far away for it to make sense it had gotten to the point where i'd like only go to the co-op once a month and it was to work my shift and then like if i was lucky i didn't have to go to work afterwards for a couple hours so i'd like be able to grocery shop and get like just like load you just load up on like on just bulk stuff that was really cheap so when i left three or four years ago i kind of was like you know what um I'm just going to do like one last mega shop and just like try to buy the longest lasting things that are like of the <laughs> highest quality that I can get for so cheap. And one of the things I bought was they had this like, just like the best honey I've ever had for sale. Like the ultimate thing for a hippie food co-op to have the best quality of, I suppose, sure. is honey. And I bought like some insane sum of honey, like six enormous like jars of honey. And Friday night making my focaccia, I'm pretty sure unless I've stashed away somewhere weird. I got to the bottom of that sixth jar of honey and used the last two tablespoons of honey in my focaccia. So now I've got to like figure out where to get that great honey now, unfortunately, probably at full price, unless I get my old friend Aura to smuggle me some jars out. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is, there is, that is a weirdly uh, poignant moment. I will say sometimes when you, when you're very familiar with an ingredient and you've had it for a really long time, when you do get to the end of it. Yeah. And just like where, like, it's just one of those weird brands of honey you can imagine that's just like, I've, I've never seen this label before. It's not like a, it's not like I'll just go to the store next door and be like, well, now this costs $15 instead of 11 It's just like, I have no idea what weird, like Vermont hippies were selling this to the co-op. What is, what is it called insofar as you can say? You know, I should have, I'm, I meant to look this up. I should have taken a picture of the, of the honey jar. I've got to go, I've got to go rummage through my recycling to, to make sure trash. I still have yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure you'll uh, you'll be able to find it. You'll be able to find it again. Yeah, I had a picture of a bee on it. I'm sure it's the only honey with a picture of a bee on it. <laughs> oh, now you got 5,066 results instead of 5,072. <laughs> Fantastic. But I wanted to, we, we've sort of have, have been already deep in the in the guts of this this question, but I, I wanted to ask you kind of the the large overarching uh, question of, of the show, which is where does cooking fit in or not fit into your 
life and your family's life at at the moment? Yeah, I mean, right now, I I think of myself as someone who like enjoys cooking. I think of myself as someone who's like good good at cooking. I don't think of myself as someone who honestly cooks a lot. And I think uh, I think about this uh, in a lot of things. Just when I'm like self examining my life, that I've lived in New York City since I'm since I was 23. I've been here 14 years. And like whenever I'm like complaining about something, I'm just sort of like, oh, it's because I live in New York. And then when I take a step back, I'm sort of like, is it because I live in New York or like, is it because my like almost my entire life, adult life has been here except for like a year. So just like with all of these problems just exist anywhere else and I'm fooling myself. So like. I don't know. I, I say to myself, like, oh, like I wish I cooked more than two or three nights a week, but it's just because I live in New York. Like, I can't <laughs> see my friend. I can't see my friends in our apartments. We have to go to restaurants. Like, oh, me and my wife work so hard because we live in New York. Um, but we're not leaving the house a lot right now. So it ha- It's been a real. Um, it's been a real uh, sea change to just sort of be like, well. Like, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've cooked more in the last six or seven weeks than I might have like all of last year, you know? I think that's why I phrased the question like fit in or not fit into your life. Cause like sometimes it's just not fitting in and then suddenly things change for you. And it seems like right now it kind of, it kind of is fitting in. Yeah, it's all, it's are there staples or are there things that in this time that you feel like you've, you've cooked a lot or you've gone back to or have been kind of like workhorses for you? I have been trying to do a lot of new stuff. I've been cooking a lot of recipes I've never cooked before. And I think, I think like the first, I mean, Casey and I were like really serious about staying in pretty early. Like the last time I was on the subway might've been like March 11th or 12th. And even that day I was like, should I really be on the subway still? I had like a appointment that had been on the calendar for a long time. Like I wasn't, even going to work then but I like even by then I wore a mask on the subway and like tried not to touch anything but like even by the time I got home that day I was like I don't think I'm going out anymore like I had an audition like the next day and I canceled it I was like I'm not going to go to an audition um but my wife my wife has been really sick we have good news which is that she uh, is in remission now but she was uh diagnosed with cancer the last this last fall and so she was still doing chemotherapy so it was just like really high risk for us to go out so we I feel like really for six weeks, we're just like really barely leaving the house, like barely doing any delivery or takeout. And I just, I just cooked a lot of different stuff that I had not cooked before. Recipes my mom sent me that she saw that she thought looked good. Weird recipes I saw like on YouTube on the two or three cooking channels that show up in my recommended. I cooked a bunch of Korean food, which I'd never done before, but was fun and exciting to do and just different. And it was, and it's, just, it's like sort of a wake up call to be like, Oh, like I didn't think I could cook this food, but it's just because I needed to buy these six different ingredients. <laughs> sure. Right, that yeah. Like, that like weren't in my grocery store growing up right but now. Now are like, I can go to specialty grocery stores or like now just because the way the culinary landscape of America has changed, like, Oh, here's Wegman's brand gochujang, like in the international (laughs) aisle at Wegman's. So yeah, I I don't know, maybe two or three weeks ago, there was a week where I was just, I like really got worn out or I I thought I was worn out by like the process of just like, I think honestly just cooking my, my, my butt off for several weeks. And I kind of like took a week off. I was like, whatever, we'll have leftovers and we'll eat stuff out of the freezer and we'll order a little bit more as like Casey's done with her chemo. And I, I think we're starting to loosen up a little bit about like what is dangerous and what isn't dangerous um, during quarantine. And I, by the end of that week, I realized I was in a really miserable mood. And I was like, I think it's because I decided to take the week off cooking. Like not that, not that like I was like dancing around the apartment, like singing while I was cooking. Not that it brought me that much like um, explicit joy, but that it just gave like a little bit more framework and a little bit more like scaffolding to what my day was like. You know what I mean? That it's like, oh, interesting. Okay, I'm kind of going to work. and I'm going to kind of be on email from like the morning 
to the evening and then like all right around like six or seven i'm gonna spend an hour or two cooking and like hanging out with casey and then we'll sit down and eat that not not that that was like i was fatigued of that but at the same time like adding it back into my schedule at the end of that week was just sort of like okay i have a little bit of a of a backbone to my day that yeah that that is so interesting i think one one thing you said really struck me and that is the idea of it's not as though i'm you know dancing around the kitchen every time i'm cooking and i do think that is something that's sort of so important to kind of like highlight or to realize or def- definitely something that i've been realizing a lot recently where you know when i was first starting out in my sort of like home cooking life and there would be a lot of being really stressed and being like, why did I decide to cook this? This is way too ambitious for where I'm at. I don't have nine things that I need to make this, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a lot of like frustration and feeling flustered and then sort of started to get into a flow where that was happening less and less. And then more and more recently, right now, have have been cooking a lot and Haley's been cooking a lot as well. And I've started to feel that way again or like, oh, the other night I made these burgers. It's a food and wine recipe that I took on board a long time ago for a Shake Shack burger that has like a Korean twist or it's like a Shake Shack style burger where it's like it's got bacon and it's got it's a couple of patties and but you also have like kimchi on there and you might mix some sambal into the mayo and whatever and so I was like oh we actually have all this stuff pretty much I have to do a different hot sauce but we have all this stuff where I could do that. We should do that. That'll be great. I love that recipe. And then while I was doing it, I was so stressed because I was like, this will be burgers. It's easy. And not without realizing it, I was like, oh, there's nine different elements and I'm doing them all at the same time. And everything is happening. And I thought this would be easy, but it's not. This was a bad choice for tonight. And it is, I think like allowing that cooking can be, a part of your life that gets to be bad sometimes and gets to be good sometimes. And that's okay. And that doesn't mean that your relationship to it is bad or good. I think it's like, and then it just ends. You cook the bad meal, you eat it. And then it's over. Exactly. And I think like, it likely (laughs) doesn't haunt you the next day. Like, like doing something bad at work can haunt you for days or weeks. Right. And, and especially right now it's like, well, I still got to do it because we got to eat. So sometimes it's just a part of life. And there was so, so long, I think, and for so many people throughout history, it has only been that. It has only been like, yeah, it might be something I enjoy, but for the most part, it's just something that I have to do. It's only recently yeah. that we've been able to to use it as a kind of like hobby. And there's like a there's like a privilege to that. But I, I, I do. I, I know what you mean. And I think like hearing you say that almost made me feel better about what I've been experiencing recently. Yeah, like I, I enjoy cooking and like there is like a joy to it and like there's a joy to a finished product that you're really proud of or that you're really happy to serve someone but like in the end there's always part of it that's a chore you know it's a chore that is likely more fun for you than cleaning a toilet but there's someone out there in the world there's somewhere someone out there in the world that would rather scrub the dishes or clean the toilet than cook that just it just hates it and And that's okay that's um yeah, and that's fine. And for for whatever reason, it's it's been fun for me. Like both, I mean, both my parents enjoyed cooking, and um, and like have continued to be great cooks. Um, I don't I don't know why I caught the bug or what it was about me that caught a bug. But there's when you're doing it at home, like there's a fun to it and there's a joy to it. But there's also just like, like you said, you just have to do it. There's a little bit of a chore to it. So, growing up, you you were seeing both your your mom and your dad uh, cook. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were both great cooks. Um, and I, I think it has been interesting that, like, when I think about what a great cook my mom is, I I feel like I really do see a change in, like, I feel like American culture has really, really had a shift in what food is over the last twenty five years, from being something like you have to do to something that can be more inventive and more fun and. And I think like the meals my mom cooked when I was in like middle school or high school is being like really, really good. And she was a great cook, but they were a little bit more, um, I don't know, just a little bit more of like a straight down the middle, like spaghetti and meatball stuff. And now like flash forward, you know, 25 years to the year 2020, like my mom is just like a really creative, 
interesting cook that like is always trying something new. And it's, I don't know if that's because she had more free time on her hands after we got out of high school or if it in part was just like mirroring American culture of just like, of just trying new things and um, trying, like looking at, like re-examining what other cultures could add to sort of American cooking. Um, or if it's just part of my mom's personality, she, I think of her as being kind of like a lifelong learner. Like she went back to get, get her PhD later in life in her fifties and, um, and man, she's a really good cook now. What are some things that stick out to you where you're like, I can't believe my mom made X. Uh, I don't know, maybe like, like two years ago, we went to her house for Christmas in Richmond. She's recently retired to Richmond. I didn't grow up in Richmond. But she was like, oh, by the way, like I was, ta- I met a guy and maybe he like had been her house painter or something. And like he knew a guy and I was thinking on Christmas Day, it'd be really fun if we roasted oysters. So I bought 108 oysters and he's bringing them by later today. And it was just like, what? <laughs> like, it's, it, like, like seafood, like that sort of seafood was very much not part of like my growing up. And I think in part that might have been hampered by like the tastes of like, you know, the young Evan and Andrew and Michael Gregory, like we weren't that adventurous eaters, but it's just sort of like, okay, I got to go buy some <laughs> propane at the Home Depot so we can grill out your, these 108 oysters. But it's like, we were, we didn't grow up Catholic. We weren't doing like the feast of the seven fish or anything, but that was like, that was Christmas. Wow. That was Christmas day. With my so mom. you guys did them, you guys did them on the grill? Yeah. That's you know what? So Actually cool. we were supposed, we were supposed to do them on the grill and then there ended up being a problem with the grill and we did them in the oven. We broiled them, but they were great. Oh, that's um, so cool. What, but what, but what in a the, way, that's like, is in a way, that's not even like a great example of my mom's cooking because it's like really simple where like my mom is notorious for like you show up at for a visit at her house and she like has a chart for like what you're eating for the entire five days. And she's like, OK, and it gets it gets it gets pretty involved. So like in a way, the oysters is not a great example of that because that is a recipe that's just like you put them in the oven when they're cracked, they're done. But conversely, I feel like to mess with the Christmas menu i think is it, it illustrates definitely an amount of 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 boldness in and of itself even if it's just to make something very kind of i would say simple on the one hand like oysters but also kind of like cool and 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 fancy and and unique and to 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 mess with the menu on christmas i mean did you guys have a sort of growing up a like set these are the things that we usually eat around the holidays or that this is kind of upsetting that tradition or was this sort of like oh we're always kind of doing different stuff our big thing we we usually had a really big i I admire this by my mom this is fun that we usually did a really big christmas eve meal and that christmas eve meal usually featured a ham it was like kind of a very like virginian meal because it was a ham it was, she usually would make a shrimp bisque that was truly excellent. She still does that sometimes for Christmas Eve. And then she would make a family recipe that I believe was my grandmom got from a restaurant in Richmond. My, my mom grew up in Richmond. And the, rest, the restaurant has super, a uh, super Richmond name, the Chesterfield. And... Chesterfield rolls were a big thing at all of our family gatherings. So there'd be Chesterfield rolls. But part of my mom's goal with this pretty amazing spread on Christmas Eve, and we eat early, we'd go to church, and we'd go to like Christmas Eve parties at friends' houses, was my mom's goal was always to not cook on Christmas. So on one hand, she was mm. like cooking like a like a really insane spread on Christmas Eve. But I feel like with some families, like the poor mom would be doing that on Christmas Eve, and then she'd just be doing it again on Christmas. Right. Where uh, what I appreciated that my mom was like, I'm cooking a whole ham on Christmas Eve. Like that's what we're eating on Christmas day. We're just going to eat ham sandwiches all day and leftover shrimp bisque. That's great. Why, why make two different meals? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And there is something that is sort of like very observant of the idea of like, Hey, it's Christmas. I just, it's a holiday. I don't want to have to like do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. She wanted to be in her PJs all day too. (laughs) Um, but that, but I will say, but the Christmas Eve dinner was pretty locked in with the ham and the Chesterfield rolls and the, and the shrimp bisque. What defines a Chesterfield roll? Is it just a really good dinner roll? It's a really good dinner roll. It's very fluffy it's very, um, it's very buttery. It, it's pretty yeasty. It's really good. I, 
of Casey and I, my wife and I have hosted our family's Thanksgiving for about five or six years now. Oh, wow. And, and one year, it's honestly not that much of a big deal for us. Like, it's not that much of a, I don't really see it as being like a culinary achievement on my part because there's a lot of delegating. So there's not too much we have to cook, but one early year I made the mistake. Not it shouldn't have been a mistake, but I gave myself the Chesterfield rolls, which I really see as being a crucial component to the Gregory family Thanksgiving. And I just I botched them. They were just like little hard little nubbin. They didn't rise. They were really hard and crunchy. And I think it might have been the first year we hosted. So it was like Casey's family's first opportunity to have a Chesterfield roll. And they were like, these are fine, Andrew. These are good. And just like, <laughs> eh. and just like every year since, I'm just like, no, mom's, mom's, mom's back in charge of the Chesterfield rolls. I think there's some milk involved, which I don't oh. think of as being normal on bread. Um, and uh, sure enough, they were, they were amazing. They were really good. My mom and I still talk about what could have gone wrong with my Chesterfield rolls five years ago. Was the yeast bad? Had it been in my fridge too long? Did I add water that was too hot so I killed the yeast? We don't know, but I'm not. I'm not going to try to make them again for Thanksgiving. That's for sure. <laughs> maybe, or, I could, maybe I or should. You, I should try. Or you, you have to. I should the practice other now. I should. Yes, I should that's do right. Because that's the thing. Is like the Chesterfield roll. You're not just making that on a normal Friday. Or I wouldn't. Right. You're saving it for a holiday, but then you don't have any warm up. You don't have any practice. You know? Precisely. If you had been making Chesterfield rolls every week instead of the focaccia, you would already yeah. be. As good as no. one of Lord Chesterfield's descendants at making this roll. <laughs> no, a sourdough uh, Chesterfield roll. That's no. I think that would just be that'd be sacrilegious. I think the other the the major thing at my grandmother's Thanksgiving and her Christmas, which I think is a truly insane thing, and I also don't know how this started. I don't know if it was a local restaurant or not. Was the crab? She made this insane crab casserole. Huh. Um, Do you tell. It was just like it's just so strange to have like have just like the turkey, the mashed potatoes, all the normal stuff. And then just like at the end of the line, like, and here's a huge pile of crab. So for a while, we <laughs> for a while, and Michael became kind of notorious at being like smart enough to realize like earlier than the rest of us, that's like turkey is good. But you know what's better than turkey? Crab. And Michael gained a reputation for skipping the turkey to load up on crab. <laughs> so that's that's been one of his main assignments in the last couple of years at Thanksgiving is it's like, you know, if you're if you're gonna really plow through the crab, dude, you're you're the one bringing the crab casserole. And so that's basically just crab and some sort of dairy and and like what is like potatoes in there, breadcrumbs. What are we what are we no, looking at? It's a basically an enormous sum of crab mixed <laughs> with a mixed with a white sauce and covered then in an enormous layer of cheddar cheese. Ooh, yeah. It's so just, it's basically just a giant crab dip. Yes, it's an Oh wow. Crab. That sounds fantastic. But yeah, I could understand. With, you're just eating with a fork. Why you would fixate on that as a child and and Over. and why you would take that mantle on to uh make the crab casserole, you'd be a hero. Yeah, and why you why you would focus on that over turkey. It's like turkey is fine, but the although the real, I mean, I think everyone enjoys this at my Thanksgiving, but it could scandalize some. You know, here I here DC Pearson is building me up as this great home cook. But what do I do at my own Thanksgiving when I host it is I order a pre-cooked turkey, DC, you know? Hey, I, why you know, not? Some of the, you know, here, but here, I guess we're going back to, you know, our idea of chore versus joy. Right. Exactly. And it's just like, and like my thinking with the Chesterfield rolls is like that year I screwed, I screwed up the Chesterfield rolls and that kind of sucks. But like, you know what? There's eight other sides and there's the turkey. But if you screw up the turkey, you just really screwed up Thanksgiving. And for me, that the risk versus reward proposition there is just wrong to like, I'm not going to be roasting a turkey more than once a year. Like, I'm just going to order it from this rad ass company in Texas that smokes thousands Ooh. of turkeys yeah. and mails them to you. And it's just also, I just don't honestly think turkey is that good. But somehow this smoked turkey is just so doggone good. I'd rather have the smoked turkey with all these great sides that everyone made and brought. We all well, cooked. I, we all got together. We all enjoyed yes, it. But we had this absolutely. better turkey than I'm ever going to make. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think that the, the, when you were saying earlier, it's mostly delegation. It's like, well, that's like a really important thing because nobody wants that effect of, 
we're all sort of gathered around and then there's like swearing coming out of the kitchen. That is not going to make yeah. for a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I, it's like you and Casey are, you are put, captaining the party and you're hosting it. And a big part of that is figuring out like, what can everybody do so everybody feels included? And then also it's great and everybody's contributing something and everybody sort of knows what their role or what their job is. And you guys have like, legit traditions around this stuff now and part of that is like we get this turkey from this really great place it doesn't <laughs> i guess what i'm trying to say is if i could boil it down to a zen like statement uh sometimes an important part of cooking can be not cooking right i love it yeah just of of you you, you got to pick your battles you know what i mean you can worry about the mashed potatoes yes. we can worry about the chesterfield rolls we can even worry about the crab casserole because you can, I don't know, it's harder to screw it up, screw up, because you're not going to overcook it or undercook it. You're just melting a bunch of wet crab. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the turkey, the turkey, you don't want to screw up. And man, let me tell you, Greenberg, Greenberg smoked turkeys makes some really fine smoked turkeys. Honestly, it was the the reason I found out about it was for years I had Thanksgiving for maybe five or six years. We did Thanksgiving at my dad's cousin's house when I was in like my twenties and early thirties. We'd go out to Oklahoma. And just one year I finally broke and I was just like, Linda, like what is cousin Linda, what is the secret of your of your turkey? Like your turkey is the best turkey I've ever had. And then she was just like, The secret is gobblegobble.com. You go to gobblegobble.com <laughs> and you order it. And it's really good. And I was I was kinda like Aunt Linda is like a very classy, awesome lady, and I was just like, if Aunt Linda if Aunt Linda can order her turkey on gobblegobble.com and I, too, can order my turkey on gobblegobble.com. Absolutely. And to shift gears for a sec, how we came to know each other was through working on this really awesome, I think uniquely wonderful, if I can sort of toot my own horn or toot our own horn, <laughs> uh, web series for your group, the Gregory Brothers Song Voyage, where you all traveled to multiple countries in this in the in the, the first season it was all pacific rim countries i believe uh, japan south korea the philippines vietnam australia am i missing any mongolia mongolia that's right and it was really neat you guys would collaborate with these local musicians and make these kind of a blend of like documentary and narrative and sketch. And then with original songs, one of the songs that you guys made with a Japanese yodeler named Takeo who had a novelty hit with a like chicken yodeling song in the like eighties and nineties or kind of throughout his life at multiple points, you guys made a song with him that then became like a giant crazy viral hit especially in 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 asia and it was so cool it was neat to be a part of it i got to go for one leg of the trip and be um hanging out with you guys in in south korea it was directed by my friend dan ekman and 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 myself and uh my other friend uh maggie were were co-producers on it it was so cool it was so fun i i i, I promise i'm getting to a question i just got lost in remembering how great that was but um <laughs> How did getting to travel to those different countries kind of inform your cooking life, if at all? Or just were there any great eating experiences or great culinary experiences that you, you had on that trip that, that stick out to you? I will say that, that I feel like everyone who worked on that show, other than us, we were working on the show because... We helped come up with it, and we're very excited about it. But I feel like the entire cast and crew, like even like including Dan to a point. I mean, although he was excited about the project and did a great jo job with the project, like if you are come to with that job offer, it's just like, hey, do you want to be paid to go to these six <laughs> countries? It's like everyone was just sort of like, uh, yes, definitely. What are you paying me? It's just so <laughs> such a unique work. Yeah experience to be in those I and mean, we're in all six of those countries in six weeks maybe even in five weeks so in a way it was like a with really a with insanely... a baby with a baby we should say yes evan and sarah my... two members of the gregory brothers had just had just had a child that was that was along and yeah my... yeah it was just insanely ambitious yeah i, I believe there were only 11 people tra in the traveling group so you're looking at a traveling group 
working on a professional television show in which 8% of the people on the trip are nine-month-old babies. <laughs> so we were we felt a little strapped in terms of... And another 8% of the crew is a professional babysitter to watch that baby. But the... I was watching some of it recently. Like, I know the songs pretty well. Like, the way the... The way we ended up posting it all on YouTube, there's like 15 to 18 minute long episodes, and we posted all those, but we also posted the songs as standalones, because each episode had a song that's, you know, three or four minutes long. I know the songs pretty well, but some of the edio- the some of the longer videos I hadn't watched in a while, and I, I was going back and watching one recently. I needed to, like, clip something from one of them for work, and there was a scene, it was actually in the South Korea episode, that I come back from, in it. I come back from the future. I mean, they're kind of shot as documentaries, but they're just like exceedingly (laughs) fake and plotted. And I come back from the future to tell the four Gregory brothers that robots are going to take over the world in the future. It's kind of a Terminator 2 ripoff. And I'm like dressed in tinfoil. We made like a tinfoil costume. And like the special effect is like me jumping like six inches in the air and like landing. And like there's like a really brief, like fast pit a pat scene there where Evan and Michael and Sarah and myself are trying to prove to me from the future that I am that I am actually myself from the future. And there's just like a really fun pit-a-pat, like pit-a-pat isn't the word, just like a uh, rat-a-tat scene where I'm describing like the 2016 election, or I think we, I think we shot it for the 2016 election, but then it took so long for it to come out that we had to ADR it to be about the 2020 <laughs> election because we oh, shot man. it in 20, we shot it in 2015, but it came out in like December 2016 so we were like ADRing it and it's like there's just some really dumb line where I, th- I think Evan asks me I think some of this we came up with on set we're just like because you were there and Dan was there and we we're just kind of riffing and it's like Evan asked me who wins the 2020 election and I say Hillary and he goes yes I love Hillary Clinton and I go no Hillary Duff which like already is kind of an LOL for me, but then it cuts back to Evan and he just goes, yes, I love all Hillary's. <laughs> There's just something like I'd totally forgotten about that line. And it just like, I don't know why it just really killed me. The idea of just Evan loving all Hillary's. <laughs> now I'll reveal to you something here, DC. Sure. That I, I watching that scene back, I remembered and I kind of regret that we slept on this. This is an internal argument among the Gregory brothers, which is when we got to South Korea and we found out you were coming to South Korea, I was like, I think it would be really funny. I feel like DC and I just look enough alike. (laughs) I was like, I think we should cast DC as me from the future. (laughs) We are definitely from the same genre of guy. Yeah, we're from the same genre of guy that would be cast. <laughs> and I've just gotten off be... an international flight, so I look like a more haggard, i.e. future version of you. Yeah, and I was just like, I think... <laughs> That's great. I, I was like, you know, we're, we're both the kind of screen presence who would be cast to play an annoying hipster with a man bun in a national advertisement. I've been a man bun for, for, yeah. for fun and profit, for sure. And like, you, re- you read the sides, and the sides is like, well, actually... Yes, they're like, yes. what can like? How can we put everything annoying in this character? Somehow, yes, and, you and I and, are getting... and long may that archetype thrive, might I say? Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, I <laughs> at some point pitched. I at some point pitched DC just for our employability. As Andrew yes. from the future. And for whatever, whatever for whatever reason, I, I was shot down. I, th- I think he would have been great as Andrew from the future. Oh, thanks, man. And and way to drive a wedge between me and the rest of the Gregory brothers. I I. Uh... Yeah, I'm that's, gonna... that's why they haven't. That's why they haven't been returning their calls. <laughs> um, were there things that you that you ate that stood out to you, or that kind of s- snapped into focus for you? Like, oh, I think this is. I have now a broader picture of like what this country's like food is like, or food food scene is like, or like flavors are are like. I remember going to a really great restaurant meal with you, in uh, Seoul. Where we went and had to like Korean barbecue, which like honestly I'm not sure I'd ever had before. Like I I hadn't eaten a lot of Korean food, and I remember us like trying to barbecue. Like we were like barbecuing the meat yourself, like you're supposed to do it at a Korean barbecue, and like we like set off the smoke detector or something. And I remember the waiter like coming over and just like rolling his eyes at us and just like and like barbecuing the meat for us and then like serving us. And we we're like, oh yeah, this is really good. We were like, <laughs> we were like 
kind of like daintily like trying to lay out like each single strip of meat and he just kind of like rubbed it all over the whole pan and then gave it to us that was really i don't know if you remember <laughs> that meal i remember i do i do i remember going to like a really great like creperie in saigon that like someone had looked up that was like a big anthony bourdain place that was just like one of those places where you just order everything you want in a foreign country and get like three drinks and then like the tab comes out for like the whole table to like twenty dollars and you're just like okay this is how people travel for months on end in other countries um and i i had one of the most memorable meals i've ever had this is really funny. I don't know if you remember this from the Australian episode, DC. You might not mention or remember this, but there's a line in the song where Evan is like, the the song there is called Didgeridooing It Right. And it's mm-hmm. like, you're, it's all about like your mind being blown by the power of the didgeridoo to like realize things you never realized before because the didgeridoo is such a beautiful, powerful, like spiritual instrument. And Evan has a line that's like, you think about your high school bully. He must have had a tough situation. <laughs> and we suggested to Portal A that they that they float in and out a transparency of Evan's high school yearbook page. <laughs> and like Evan's picture next to the picture of his purported high school bully. And I don't know, we're, you know, we're YouTubers. We just like kind of do what we want on our channel generally. You know, of course, we have like more copyright concerns as the years have passed. But Portal A, you know, the production company just does things a lot more by the book. And they were like, oh, that's a really funny idea, but there's no way we can do that. Like, we don't know how you'd be able to get in touch with this person who's next to you in the yearbook. And we also don't know if they would be willing to have their likeness used in a situation where they're being referred to as a bully. (laughs) Um, And like, first of all, I don't think they just like we grew up in just such a small town. Like my graduating class from our, the only public high school in our town was 77 students. Oh, wow. Um, the average graduating class, mine was a little small, was probably more like a hundred. It's just a really, really small town. So it's like comical to us that like, we wouldn't, that like, you just know the people next to you in the yearbook in Radford, Virginia. Right. <laughs> but the other thing we were able to report to them was we were like, we think we're going to be able to get in touch with Jesse Gillespie he actually took us out to lunch in Tokyo. <laughs> Whoa! And Jesse, he'd even like done some of the translation for us for the episode. But Jesse has like remained friends with Evan and now has lived in Tokyo for like 15 or 20 years. He he works at a Japanese law firm. Um, like he's like, he's truly a part of Japanese culture now. And he took us out to lunch. He agreed, of course. He gave, he signed whatever portal I wanted him to sign to have his picture used in the Did You Doing It Right episode. But he took us to one of the weirdest restaurants I've ever been to in my life. It was maybe the fanciest restaurant I've ever been to in my life. And it was a Japanese, like, it maybe had two Michelin stars, which I'd never been to a restaurant wow. like before. I, and the, But the thing about it that was so fascinating was that this food they serve is modeled after the food that is served in a Buddhist monastery. And the food that is served in a Buddhist monastery is like, of course, vegetarian. But on top of that is supposed to be boring. Like you're serving food that's supposed to be boring on purpose to not. So you don't like pique the interest or the attention of a Buddhist monk. And it's just so insane that this is kind of it's like uh, it's an oxymoron, really, like. Once you make that food so good, it's getting two Michelin stars. It's not really monk's food anymore, right? Because then it is good and a monk would like it. And you're supposed to be making food they don't like. But it was also really bizarre to be eating like an all vegetarian meal. And all of the flavors are insanely boring, are like loyal to monk's food requirements, that it's incredibly boring. Yet somehow other elements of the food that you don't usually think about are so insanely good that this restaurant got two Michelin stars like... It was all like like all the textures were like textures I'd never experienced eating before. It's like a it's like a loophole. Like, well, we can't make the flavors interesting, so we'll make the textures interesting. Oh wow, yeah. I have I read an essay a little while ago about I think it's I I I'm gonna act like I remembered. I didn't. I I looked it up. I think it is called like shojin cuisine. Is okay. this sort of like Japanese sort of temple kind of like, yeah. And, and it's, it's a very, 
that's so interesting. I, I knew that I was, and that's kind of what the essay was about, that it's like, oh, this style of cooking is now getting very, it's, you know, people are translating it sort of into like the modern world. And obviously, since a lot more people are eating vegetarian and plant-based stuff, it's kind of like taking on this new life. But I, so in reading that, you know, you're sort of reading about like, oh, and then it'll just be this little bit of this root and it's just been steamed and it's in this, just this little bit of dashi. And it sounds very meditative, like as a, as a food, was there something or what was something that you had there that you were like, oh, wow, I never expected that to, to taste like that. Do you, was there a thing that stuck out to you where, where you were like, okay, this part of this is very by design, like not a, a crazy umami bomb, but then there's this other part of it that I can't believe. I've never had something like that. I see where the two Michelin stars come in. I mean, what was really fascinating about it was all of the flavors were insanely boring. Like, yet the food was like in other ways. And it's like, how can food that is designed to be and is successfully boring still be good? But it was like the textures were so unique and so different and so perfect in ways that I didn't know textures of food could be that like that's where the interest of the meal was. Like, right. like the different, like just the way uh, like the mushroom bit, like just like the way, like where like the tofu was and it was like all these, you know, different small courses and stuff. But it's just like, I don't know when I think about like, restaurants that get Michelin stars, it's all about like richness of food and like kind of, I don't know, kind of both, um, kind of both on a literal and figurative level, right? Like, Oh wow. Like the, the, the dairy and the fat and the oil in this meal makes it really tasty, but also just like who gets Michelin stars generally expensive steakhouses, like super expensive sushi restaurants, you know, place that, you have to pay a lot of money for food that is that tastes rich. So it, it also is is just absolutely insane to me that a restaurant that is really um, I mean it's quite expensive, but the but is uh, rebelling against the the richness of the flavor and richness of the food is still like accepted as like okay yeah this is this is so amazing we're gonna give it two stars and you have to. Imagine that if they were like, okay, we're going to do all this normal monk's food and also we're going to do a steak frite, then Michelin would have to be like, all right, we'll give you three stars. <laughs> and you were there with your brother's fictional high school bully. Our brother's fictional high school bully, <laughs> Jesse Gillespie, who's like been obsessed <laughs> with Japanese culture since like age 13 or 14, when wow. it was much, much harder to be obsessed with because it was basically before the internet. And, but just like, but just, uh, did not walk away from that and, you know, was became so interested in it. He moved to Japan. He studied no theater. He was in a no theater troupe Whoa. and eventually became a Japanese lawyer. Yeah. Dude, Andrew, thank you so much for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. And I am so thrilled about Casey and, and, and that she is in remission. I know I just, you know, we're thinking of, was thinking about you guys a lot when you know, before when, when she was going through that. And then obviously, you know, now during this pandemic, it just seemed like an extra layer of just unbelievable stress that I, I can't even imagine. So I'm really glad that, that she's on the other side of it and you guys are on the other side of it. And, and thanks for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. This, this, this was great. It was a hoot. Thanks for having me on. I, I really enjoyed it, DC. Um, and, uh, Focaccia away. I don't know. I got nothing. I'll, 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 I'll send you. I'll send you the recipe. Please do. All right, that is it for this week's episode of Stay for Dinner. Thank you so much again to Andrew Rose Gregory. You can find the Gregory Brothers on YouTube and Andrew himself at A Rose Gregory on Twitter. I'm DC Pearson on Twitter or at D E E C E E Pearson on Instagram. My interstitial music is by Advanced Bass, the amazing Owen Ashworth. The intro song is July 4th, 2004 by Jason Anderson, and the cover art is by Sarah Beacon. That's B-E-C-A-N. I've written a couple of 
novels, The Boy You Couldn't Sleep and Never Had To, and Crap Kingdom. Support your local bookstore in whatever form they exist right now. And if you like hearing me talk, I read the audiobook versions that are available on Audible. That's all for now. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.